Okay, uh, I think uh, we can start uh, with the, the second lecture. No, I think, okay, well. Please, Julia, go ahead. Okay, can you still hear me well? Or? Yes, yes. I, I stop you anyway if there is any any problem. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, now we're a little bit far behind with the lectures, but still I would like to show you a little bit, um, still start a little bit where we left with uh, color relation and show you a little bit what one can do with this. So let me start again by showing you this Fiat's identity. I'll show you a little bit how this can be applied. So we saw graphically this can be represented in this form. So for instance, what can you do now with this? You can uh, say, contract it here and attach a different gluon. Okay. Then you can do the same here, attach a gluon and the same here. Okay. So what happens? You see that this, what I have here, this is nothing but simply this, uh, this uh, <clears throat> This diagram here. So in essence, where you exchange a gluon in between two gluons. So this is somehow TB, let's say TB, matrix TA, and again TB. And now what this is equal to here, we see that you have a trace of the matrix TA. So this is zero. And here, so you get that this is nothing but one over two N times this simplified diagram here. Right. So you see somehow how this is really very powerful and you can use it in, uh, to compute really a lot of uh, things. Let me give you another example. So let me maybe simply get rid of this one here. Show you another example. Suppose that uh, um, you compute an amplitude, uh, sim you're computing, I don't know, digest production, you have two quarks and you have a diagram with a gluon exchange here. Now you want to square this amplitude. Huh? So what happens in terms of color? Well, in terms of color, you can draw it in this way. So when you square it, you will have two gluon exchanges. And when you square, you contract the indices. This corresponds to closing these lines. Okay. So what is this equal to? Now you can deform these lines arbitrarily as you want. So this is really nothing but like a gluon line. If a fermion loop, gluon. Now, each of these factors, this is, uh, this is TR times this delta, and this is also TR times delta. So what you get is this is TR squared times uh, this. And this is simply N squared minus one, because this counts how many gluons you have. So you totally get that the color factor of this uh, will be essentially n squared minus one divided by four. This is the r squared. Or you can write it as a CF divided by two n, so times n over two. Right. And similarly, suppose you can take, uh, you can look at what happens if you take this amplitude, the quarks, and for instance, interfere it with something where you have um, T versus U channel, right? Now, if, uh, if you square this, if you multiply this amplitude here with this one, uh, what happens? Well, uh, you somehow close these lines again. When you square, you contract the indices uh, like this. But now you see that in this case, uh, and then we use a different color for this. Uh, you have one continuous fermion line. It's a single line here. Right. And then you have the gluon exchanged here. So in essence, this really corresponds to this diagram in terms of color. You have one fermion line, you have a gluon exchange, and if you follow the line, you see that these gluons are interchanged here like that. Now you can use what I told you before that one gluon somehow TB, TA, TB. This is nothing but minus one over two N times the same diagram where the 
this muon now disappeared. Huh? And now this again, this is the factor CF. This becomes CF over 2n with the minus sign times this. And again, this trace counts the number of quarks. So this is a factor n. So this becomes minus CF times n. Okay. So somehow you can really use these identities to compute colors, even for much more complicated amplitudes. And now I give you one maybe exercise to think about. And if you can solve this, you really understood very well how everything works here. And the exercise is as follows. Take a glue on. If you have this. So these are all gluons. Now you exchange gluons. So these are all gluons. And you cross them also here. So essentially, this involves all these factors F, A, B, C here at all points. And now, without doing any calculation, and in fact, not even any drawing, uh, you should be able to show that this is equal to zero. So this is how I think it's, uh, sorry, I do it very badly. But um, if you can show this, uh, you really understood how all these things work. Huh? Okay. Now, of course, all this color algebra enters everything you do. In, uh, in QCD, any amplitude can compute any cross sections. Part of it is the color. And the other thing I want to stress is that uh, this is now unrelated to that. But when we talked about the Casimirs of uh, the color, though, so we said that uh, this is associated to a factor CF. Uh, and a gluon from a gluon, uh, we said, is associated to a factor CA. Now, numerically, this is 4 over 3. And this is a factor of three. So really just this factor accounts for the fact that any process that involves gluons in the initial state or in the final state, typically QCD corrections are much larger. And are much larger simply because of color, because of this very simple fact here. On top of this, we will see it later. At the LHC, you have enhancement that have to do with the pattern distribution functions. So gluons have a large, uh, protons have a large content of gluons. That's why it was sections involving, for instance, gluon gluon uh, fusion to Higgs production has this very large corrections. But uh, a large part comes from color. So this is all I wanted to say now about this topic. <clears throat> and um, now what I will skip, because I think I really don't have so much time, but this is kind of standard, is a little bit, uh, the fact that, okay, from the Lagrangian, I already showed you, from the Lagrangian, you can derive Feynman rules. And uh, typically, you derive propagators from the bilinear trios in the Lagrangian. And there is an issue with the gluon propagator, which uh, is related to the fact that you have to, to introduce gauge fixing trios and so on. This is, however, pretty standard, and uh, I would like to skip this uh, and uh, somehow move a little bit on to somehow, yeah, the coupling constant ultraviolet divergence is beta function and so on. So to do this, uh, let me again uh, go back uh, to somehow this quantity, this R ratio. We already saw it. Now it's uh, this uh, ratio of uh, cross section plus and minus two hadrons over plus and minus two mu bar. Right, so let me write. So this is sigma plus minus two hadrons. So, so this is something we see many times in these lectures, but uh, it's really also something that has been uh, used a lot uh, in the past and is still uh, used. It's still, for instance, very interesting at future colliders, uh, how much one can constrain alpha s from this point. So the picture we have in mind is always this one. Let me write it here. And we already said that at lowest order, if we compute it at lowest order in perturbation theory, what we get is we count the number of quarks in the final state weighted by the sum of the charges of these quarks. Right. 
Yeah. And now you can say, well, and now I want to improve on this. I want to apply QCD to improve on this prediction. So what does this mean? It means that what you can want to do is a, say a first order calculation of this quantity. So what do you need to do if you want to do a first order calculation of that? Well, first of all, here, essentially we can focus here on the final state uh, because the initial state is only electrons, so it has no QCD at all. Huh? And then if you look at the final state, so this uh, gamma Z uh, that goes to QQ bar, huh? you have to include all the relevant diagrams at, uh, when you expand in the coupling constant. So here you have a coupling GS uh, and you can have a blue on emission from here, you can have a blue on emission from here, and then you have a somehow virtual correction like this. Now all this, uh, what I draw here, these things correspond to amplitudes. And by taking Feynman rules, essentially, we will do this a little bit later explicitly, but here essentially you plug in your Feynman rules and then you get an amplitude out of this. So this uh, we call essentially the real amplitude a one real, and this is the virtual amplitude because uh, yeah, it involves a virtual quantum fluctuation. And now the two also don't interfere because this uh, lives in, uh, when you integrate it, you integrate this over three body phase space. Uh, while this one will be integrated over two body phase space. So when you really write your amplitude uh, at first order and square the amplitude, uh, you will get, okay, the, Born amplitude uh, without any blue on emission. And then you get uh, the coupling squared. Uh, and then you get essentially the, um, the real part uh, squared and twice the interference of uh, uh, the interference of the born and the virtual. So, these two have to be integrated over the two body final state and this over the three body final state. Now, the point is that if you do this calculation and compute R1, what you get is, uh, is a very simple result that people essentially remember by heart because uh, you get that the first order correction is. Uh, First order, it's the lowest order correction, the lowest order term times one plus alpha s over pi, where alpha s is the coupling squared over four pi. Okay. okay, so first we see this somehow property that the expansion parameter that you have in these perturbative calculations is often alpha over pi, or people talk about alpha over four pi. But, um, but you get a finite result and uh, a very simple one. Now, what happens when you want to go to second order? Now, if you want to do a calculation at second order, what do you have to do? Well, you have to consistently, essentially, draw all Feynman diagrams that you have. For instance, you would have two gluons emitted from here, or you could have one gluon emitted from here, one gluon from here. Uh, or you could have, uh, say, one virtual, and the gluon emitted from anywhere could be emitted from here, could come from here, here, and so on. You will have to draw all Feynman diagrams. If you draw only a subset, the result becomes stage dependent to complete. And then, uh, again, you compute an amplitude by plugging in uh, your Feynman rules, you square the amplitude. And then you integrate all these bits over the relevant phase space. So this would be integrated over four particle phase space, this is integrated over three particle phase space. So the calculation becomes rather involved, but one can do it. And let me just tell you what the result is if you do it. So if you do this calculation, some of brute force calculation, what you get has this form alpha s over pi. And then you get alpha s over pi squared, a coefficient that is irrelevant, and then you get something that has this form, pi b0, let me tell you what this is, log of lambda ultraviolet over q squared. 
So this result tells you that when you do a second order calculation and brute force like that, your, the result you obtain is not finite. It has an ultraviolet divergence. So the result depends on this. You have to introduce an ultraviolet cutoff, and you have an explicit dependence on your result on this ultraviolet cutoff. Now you know very well what uh, one does. Uh, so this ultraviolet dependence, you already heard this from uh, Ricardo, can be integrated out. Or what we say in, in, in this normal language, modern language, is that you, you renormalize your parameters. QCD is a renormalizable theory. So you redefine your beta, in this case, the coupling constant, uh, by absorbing the ultraviolet divergence into a renormalized coupling constant. So here now, let me write explicitly, I put a zero to indicate that this was an unrenormalized coupling. And you see that if you absorb, if you redefine your coupling constant in this form, you say that the coupling constant alpha now depends explicitly on a scale, but is this Bea coupling plus beta zero log of this ultraviolet cutoff squared over a scale squared times alpha s beta squared plus something else. Now, if you write R2 in terms of alpha of mu, you get something finer. And in essence, so let me write it explicitly. R2 becomes R0, 1 plus, now I have alpha s of mu over pi plus alpha s mu over pi squared coefficient pi beta 0. And now I get the log of mu squared over q squared. Okay. So, I, okay, I don't have time to cover too much uh, this uh, topic of renormalization, but the important point to remember is that, uh, in essence, uh, in a renormalizable theory, you can redefine a finite number of parameters. So in QCD, in essence, uh, I told you it's a one parameter theory. So you renormalize the coupling constant. In fact, uh, you also renormalize the masses, the quark masses. And so the coupling becomes a scale dependent through this uh, explicitly absorbing these laws. And you also see that your physical prediction then have a explicit dependence on the scale. So let me show you here, this, uh, this uh, new here, and that's in uh, the coupling and in the scale. And you see that, so the dependence that I have on the scale in alpha here, this is a second order dependence, alpha squared, and this exactly compensates this new dependence that I have here. Okay. So the renormalization of the coupling and introduces this scale dependence, uh, scale dependent coupling. Uh, and uh, we parameterize the scale dependence. So one of some of the fundamental quantities becomes how the coupling depends on the scale. And this is uh, included in what we call the beta function. So the beta function, uh, beta function is defined uh, as mu squared times E alpha of mu squared over the mu squared. Well, so this is a logarithmic derivative. This is equivalent to saying uh, the alpha of mu squared over the log mu squared, because the dependence is logarithmic, right? So this becomes really a fundamental, um, fundamental point in QCD. We will see later why this is so important. Uh, and, uh, but maybe, uh, so maybe I'm a bit faster than yesterday. So, Maybe if there are questions or about what I said so far before I continue. I don't see any. Uh, no. If I, if I see any question at any time, okay. I stop. Okay, okay, okay. It's good if you make a break every, every now and then, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 perfect. So let me continue. So this is now a very fundamental quantity, the beta function. Now let me... Mm -hmm. 
uh, or maybe I still have it here. Now, if you look at this relation, uh, you see immediately that if I take the logarithmic derivative of this function as a function of log of mu, this is independent alpha zero, I get minus because this is log of one over mu, so I get that at lowest order, beta, at lowest order is nothing but minus p0 alpha s squared of mu squared. And then, of course, there, there will be higher order corrections to that. What one, one can also do is you take this and uh, you explicitly integrate out this equation. So you equate, uh, let me see these colors here, you equate this term to say this one here, and then integrate between two boundaries, the differential trivial differential equation. So this allows you then to relate when you integrate between two scales, mu and mu zero, you can relate alpha at one scale to alpha at a different scale. So if you, if you equate this, then you get the alpha of alpha squared. So the integral is one of alpha. So let me write what you get out of this. You get that one over alpha of mu minus one over alpha of mu zero is b zero log of mu squared over mu zero squared. Okay. And then you can relate one coupling at a scale to coupling at a different scale. Or, and now you can also define what we call lambda QCD. So lambda QCD is defined as uh, the, the value at which the coupling constant in QCD becomes infinite. So it means that one over alpha at lambda QCD, you can essentially drop this term here when you evaluate it at lambda QCD. And so you get that one over alpha of mu is equal to uh, beta zero log of mu squared over lambda squared, uh, or somehow alpha inverting alpha of mu equal one over beta zero log of mu squared over lambda squared. So this is somehow the definition of lambda that you see. By the way, Lambda is defined as a position of the pole of the coupling constant. And now you trivially see that if I would have uh, included higher order terms in this, uh, in, the, in the calculation of the beta function, there are other terms. Uh, if you include these other terms, uh, lambda changes. So lambda QCD, it, it, to some extent, is a physical scale. It has a physical interpretation, but uh, technically it depends at, on the order in which you do some calculations. Uh, now, um, so the other thing you can see from this relation is, as you know very well, in QCD, the coupling constant, when you go to large scales, the coupling becomes smaller because this coefficient V0 is positive. So you get, um, you get this logarithmic dependence on the coupling constant. Now, when you actually compute uh, the coupling constant. So when you want to compute the running of the coupling. Yeah? Scusa, sorry, Julia. Si. There is a hand raised. Ah. I, I give her. Please, yeah. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, this is kind of a naive question, but is lambda QCD definitely convergent? Say again? Uh, is lambda QCD necessarily convergent? Like, is it possible it'll diverge when you add higher orders? So we'll come a little bit to that. And uh, so maybe it's answered a little bit later. So when you, so as I said, lambda changes when you compute higher orders. But yeah, there I, I will show you explicitly how convergent this calculation is. So there is really uh, no big change when you go to higher orders there. So yes, and the answer is uh, the changes when you move to an include higher orders, the changes are really small and they're not big. So yeah, it's convergent. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing now here I wanted to stress is that, uh, so this B0 that I wrote, this coefficient, uh, essentially has two contributions. One uh, comes, uh, 
Oh, so another way to somehow say this is that the, so the beta function tells you how the coupling changes with the scale, or somehow the, how the gluon interaction changes with this. And when you want to compute it, when you want to compute actually the beta function, you have to compute diagrams like this one, so, or diagrams like this one. Now, what happens is that this contribution is negative. So what you get somehow the NF part of P0 that you get from here is proportional to do 2NF divided by 0.5. The contribution is said that you get from this contribution here is proportional to the number of colors and is in fact 11 times the number of colors divided by P squared five. So you see these two have an opposite sign, but this is larger. So sorry, when I say this, you don't see this one is larger than that one. And this somehow means that in QCD, this coefficient P0 is positive. And we get the running that we know of. In QCD, we get this type of running. If this is the scale mu, and this is the coupling of the scale mu, we get the usual what we call the normalization group and like that. Here would be the position of the pole. This is where somehow when we approach the scale, alpha becomes larger. And so around this region here, here we cannot really trust perturbative calculations because the coupling is large. We can trust perturbative QCD in this region where the coupling is smaller. But what I want to say also is that in QAD instead, you know that photons don't interact with photons. So all you have in QAD are terms that have essentially this form like this, left on loose. So in QED, you have only a negative contribution. So the running in QED is really opposite to the one in QCD. It's kind of this form and increases. So in QED also, we have a lambda. We have also a position of the pole here. And this is something that you never hear much about. And uh, maybe somebody wants to answer to why this scale is not really you know, much relevant or much mentioned. Okay, maybe I just say it if there is no. So you can compute this scale. I mean, you can essentially take, so you can take the relation that I wrote before. So I don't know why I cannot scroll. You can take this relation here and compute the alpha, for instance, putting in alpha at the scale of the electron mass, putting the electron mass and so for lambda QD. And what you obtain is a scale that is much larger than the Planck mass. So, all, uh, so for all practical purposes, uh, lambda QED is completely irrelevant. And this is why nobody really mentions the scale very much. As opposed to lambda QCD, that is somehow a physical, uh, is really relevant for what we do, in particular if you do low energy in QCD. However, one should say that the fact that uh, there is a somehow we know that QED cannot be a consistent theory up to really very high scale. So to some extent, we know that also QED has to be an effective theory. Now I want to, I don't know where I can scroll down. I want to do, sorry. So this is what I wanted to show now. This is related to the question that um, was just asked. So what I showed you before is the sum of application of the beta function to what we say one loop. So this somehow this uh, theorem and two one bubbles. And this gives this uh, red line here. Now, when you go to higher orders, so you see that somehow beta, this function changes. You have correction. So to loop, the correction is still relatively large. And then this is really a very fundamental quantity, we will see why, but this is uh, so important it has been computed up to five loops, really. But you see this uh, really beautiful convergence. So you see that when you, the jump from uh, red to blue is relatively large, but then this jump becomes smaller and smaller when you go to other orders. So. Okay. Now, okay, let me, also write down for you. So I said, okay, we, so far we talked about this beta zero coefficient, which is this, um, 
leben in Minus. Often it's written in this form, four and a half PR, where this PR is a factor one half, over 12 pi. Beta one, so beta one will involve things that have, for instance, two gluons, so we'll have something that has a theorem proportional to n squared, if they are proportional to n and f, where there is a gluon with a fermion loop and something with uh, cf and f. So this is a second order coefficient. Okay. Now the other coefficient, so these are the coefficients that enter this relation where you write beta, you write it typically in this form, alpha s squared, and then you sum, write this as a sum, bi alpha S to scale mu to the power i. And these are the coefficients. As I said, these are known to many orders, but very often you only find these two quoted. And there are two reasons for that. One is that, okay, the more orders you compute, the more involved these expressions are. But there is also the fact that when you go to higher loops, the coefficients of the beta function become schema dependent. So the coefficients from, uh, from B2 on B2, sorry. The coefficients B2, B3 and so on, they are all scheme dependent. What does this mean? It means that when you renormalize the cutting and find a way to absorb the infinities that you have, you have an arbitrariness on what you do with the finite parts. And this arbitrariness is what we call scheme definition. Typically, today we talk about alpha s in what we call the MS bar scheme. But if you take a coupling in a different scheme, obviously the beta function will change as well. And what you could try to do as an exercise is to prove that this is somehow B0 and the coefficient B1, and this is somehow non-trivial, is instead scheme independent. B0 is to some extent really trivial. B1, one has to work it out. Really. Julia, yeah. there is a question. Yeah. We asked to unmute Mehmet. Uh, hello, uh, can you uh, comment on uh, scheme uh, dependence and uh, uh, physical observability of uh, this lambda QCD? So is it... Uh... Yes, yes, yes. So, mm -hmm. scheme dependence. Let's see if I can go uh, down. Uh, the second here. So, for instance, uh, you see that here, when I wrote this uh, expression of alpha nu, I somehow related my renormalized coupling here to the beer coupling by absorbing this log of uh, the ultraviolet, so the infinities uh, that I take. Uh, these infinities now, we will see it later, they tend to show up as log of some uh, scale or as poles in epsilon and so on. But when you absorb them, you have to absorb everything that is infinite, but you're free to change the finite parts here. Right? So here, for instance, rather than absorbing this, one could change, for instance, the scheme mu or add a finite theorem to this. And this is what we call scheme definition. Right? So you really have to say when, in fact, when you call the coupling constant, you always have to say this is the coupling constant in a given scheme. The same is true for masses. So when you talk about the mass, for instance, you talk about the top mass, you can say this is the top mass in the MS bar scheme, or this is the top mass in say, the pole scheme, and numerically they can be different. Because somewhat technically, they, yeah, they are simply different. Now, the other question was about uh, um, observability. Well, so, sorry, you, you also asked something else. So, okay, let me also say that because this is also something that maybe we need to draw this relation that I write down, is the following, that mm, this is what you also need to prove this uh, B0 and B1 are scheme independent. That if you have a coupling, a constant, uh, sorry. so alpha S, uh, 
you know, a scheme that I call here A of mu. This can be always written as the same coupling in schema B of A. One plus something that is higher order. So two, two couplings in different schemes have to be related by finite terms that are higher order in their definition. So this is then a plus a here plus even higher order. So, so you can always relate them using finite, uh, finite relations. And this uh, translation from one scheme to another can be computed in perturbation theory and can be computed even to many groups. So in essence, when you compute, uh, suppose that you measure, you want to measure the top, uh, from the top uh, TP bar total cross-section measure the velocity. What do you do? Okay, you could measure the cross-section, then you compute it and you compute, you do a calculation using a coupling constant in a given scheme, but also the mass in a given scheme. And then when you equate the cross section to your calculation, what you extract is a mass in one given scheme. And this is all what is really observable. So there is no universal alpha, or there is no universal top mass. So there is always in a given scheme. Does this answer the question? Uh, yes, and this is also uh, is for lambda QCD. It's also scheme dependent. Or is okay. it? And the same, except it's for lambda QCD, exactly. So lambda QCD depends uh, on the scheme, on uh, the order at which you do a calculation, on the number of flavors that you include. Um, um, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Often you see that lambda is written often as lambda something. Charlie, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, there is another question. Yeah. Let me finish. Often you see lambda with say phi first. Often you see something like this lambda phi permits, which means lambda with the five flavors in the MS bar scheme. Like somehow. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Also. Oh, it's really uh, a question uh, on the same argument, on the same topic. But is this due to the fact that we are doing perturbation theory? I mean, if we uh, could compute at all order a physical observable, would it be dependent on the scheme or this would be finally independent on the scheme? If we would compute to all orders, uh, observable, it would be independent on the scheme. Okay. So the scheme dependence, uh, is always one order higher on the calculation that you have done. Okay. So as you see it somehow here, at the lowest order, this is the relation that you have. When you compute both quantities to alpha to one order higher, then they will agree to that order and the skin dependence moves on to the next order. And this is the same for the scale, if you want. So there is always this scale dependence. Scale dependence is also related to the fact that we are truncating these expansions. And so the dependence on the scale is always one order higher to the order which we do the calculation. Okay, thank you. Your audio is bad again, uh, Julia. I don't know why, but it looks like uh, more about that. Moment. Um, I don't know. Is it uh, better? Maybe I can get closer to them. Is it still bad? Eh? It's worse than before, but. I mean, I can again, let me see. Now? Looks better. Let, let's see. There is another question. Anne Catherine, I am mute. Please. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um... Is there a quick way to explain what MS bar is, or is that a long discussion? What MS bar is? Huh? Uh -huh. Uh, like what, what it entails? I, I think I'm probably doing it in the next lecture. So if you okay, want great. to postpone it to that, um, 
Otherwise, I can say very, very briefly two words here about this. I mean, in essence, <clears throat> divergences come from, say, integrals like this one. Let's, let's look at this integral. So here you're integrating dl, d4l. Okay, let's maybe even forget about the structure. Typically, you have integrals that have this form, L squared, let's say L minus M squared. Let's think this is just a scalar theory and so on, it doesn't matter. So what you see here is you have this logarithmic divergence, so D for L over L4. And so in the ultraviolet, this will create a log. It's really like DX over X at large X, it's logarithmic divergent. So what, what is often done, so originally there were different approaches and so on. What now everybody does is the following. Rather than integrating in four dimensions, you switch to D equal four minus two epsilon dimensions. And you leave this epsilon, you don't say anything about epsilon. The nice thing about this, uh, we will see later, that there are these ultraviolet divergences and also infrared ones. So something like this, uh, dx over x uh, is divergent both uh, ultraviolet and infrared. Now, if you change this to x1 plus epsilon, uh, but don't say anything about epsilon, uh, keep epsilon finite, uh, this somehow regulates both divergences, ultraviolet or infrared for positive or negative epsilon. Uh. Since you don't say anything about epsilon, uh, this is really nice, you don't have to worry. Now, ultraviolet divergences, uh, show up as poles in epsilon and become essentially give rise to this kind of poles, one of epsilon poles. Now, when you introduce this, uh, when you change dimension, uh, so this D4L, uh, to preserve the dimensionality really becomes something like this, DDL, uh, and there is this factor new to the epsilon. But then it turns out uh, that uh, when you do these calculations, so you don't only get this one over epsilon, but you essentially see that this one over epsilon come always in a given, uh, it's always together with these terms. Uh, these terms are due to the fact that there is an overall uh, factor that involves the gamma matrices and so on. When you expand them out, they appear in this combination. So this is what we call one over epsilon bar. Uh, and the MS bar schema means uh, I subtract the epsilons together in this, uh, together with these finite terms. Uh, this is what becomes an MS bar schema. You see that it's completely arbitrary, you know? The only reason people do it is that they don't want to have this gamma layer on the log of four pies uh, around. They are always there, always the same, so you absorb them and them. Um, and this is precisely the MS scheme would be only one of epsilon. Uh, Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So it's basically just dimensional regularization with that yeah. one extra step so, of absorbing the constants. Regularization is some of these changing dimension. This allows you to do calculations. And then your calculations still have poles. Huh? And then renormalization is what do you subtract? How do you subtract these poles? Huh? Right. Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see if I can. So here now I wanted to show you maybe, yeah, a little bit. So this is somehow how the running of the coupling works and so on. You see somehow that when you change an F, so when you run from low energy to high energy, there are some of these little thresholds in the beta function. So really the slope changes very slightly, but it changes. And for instance, people even talk about uh, you know, measuring the running of the coupling at very high scales and seeing if you're sensitive to heavy force that would affect this running at high scales. And so, and the other thing you see here is that the typically, we always quote alpha at the Z mass. This is because the original, the very precise measurements were done at length when it measured at the Z mass. But so this coupling here is, as I said, is 0.118. And so one should keep in mind this 0.1. If you compute an log, you see the means that you have 10% of the order of 10%, next to next to the order of the order of 1%. But in many cases, in fact, it's not really like that. So this is a little naive counting if you want. So this is how the running 
looks like that. And now I uh, wanted to say just a few words about the renormalization group equation, what we call RG equations. Renormalization group equations. So now if you think, uh, if you think a quantity that, um, that depends on a single scale, for instance, we could think again of our R ratio if you want. The R ratio certainly depends on the center of mass energy. And, uh, but it's dimensionless. The R ratio is a ratio of cross section, has no dimension. So if, uh, if you wouldn't be working in a quantum field theory, this R ratio should be constant. In fact, at lowest order, it is constant, right? But when you, when you renormalize the coupling constants, as we did, you see that the renormalization introduces a second scale new. Right? So R, even if it depends on a single quantity, depends if you want to. Well, Okay, let's, uh, this is generic, let's, uh, let's call it A, any, any observable. It depends really, we say that it depends on the scale over mu squared and on alpha s over mu squared. And so it can have a non-trivial dependence on the scale Q by through the renormalization. So renormalization group equation means that, now if you take the total derivative, of this quantity with respect to the scale mu that you introduce artificially, it's not a physical scale, you introduce it to renormalize the coupling, then this should be zero. So explicitly we write that mu squared, the explicit derivative of the function with respect to mu plus mu squared, the derivative of alpha s that depends on mu squared over the mu squared times the derivative of the function over alpha, so this is somehow the total derivative of the scale q squared over mu squared, alpha s of mu squared, this object is zero. Now you see that this group that appears here, this is nothing but the beta function. Right? So this is my function beta of the coupling constant. So what this means is that somehow they depend, so if you know a quantity at one scale and you know the beta function, you can compute the given quantity in perturbation theory at any other scale. This is why somehow the beta function is really fundamental in QCD. If you want to know something at a scale and you want to know it at a different scale, if you, have the couple, if you have the beta function, you can complete this. And uh, now, okay, I want to just show you here this idea. These are some more measurements uh, of the coupling constant. And typically, okay, now the coupling, so this is, uh, so th these measurements are typically updated in the particle data book. And the way this is presented is that different observables are split in categories now. And then when, um, the PDG now essentially performs a free average of different categories. And this is what is somehow shown here. So you see, for instance, how the case is an important category. Now, we have calculations from lattice QCD. These uh, structure functions are essentially measurement in the classic scattering. And then uh, you have things like E plus E minus going to jets uh, or even the R ratio that we discuss. And uh, then uh, you have, you see, for instance, uh, G theta, which does a global fit of different observables, including alpha S. And finally, these were the first measurements of uh, the PQ bar cross section. You can uh, extract alpha S also from PQ. So the picture that you get see here, you see that uh, very different uh, observables at very different energy. So the tau decay is really very low energy, while uh, the bar cross section CMS reaches very high energy. So they are really, the picture is consistent. The, the coupling constant, as I mentioned, is not so, so small at our scale. So 0.1 means that these co corrections are important. Uh, in particular, the, weight uh, becomes small at higher energy is only logarithmic. So these corrections remain important if you go even go to a harder TV machine. And um, yeah, 
the other thing is, however, you see that there, there, are, there are tensions between these uh, classes of measurement. And this is something there are really a lot of discussions on that. Uh, in, uh, overall, I mean, uh, the world average now is essentially 0.118. Uh, 0 uh, so let me. Sorry. Now, so the world average 0.118 plus minus 0.001. So the error is on this digit here. It's a not of 1% uncertainty. This is the worst known coupling that we have so far. Compared to all our couplings, this is some of the large, largest error, 1%, but it's really not so easy to, to measure this precisely. Right. Um, yeah, so maybe this is... Uh, all I wanted to say now about alpha S and so on, and uh, maybe I have one more plot uh, showing, uh, yeah, here. This is how what I mentioned, these very different measurements, right? Uh, you see the running. Uh, so on one side, the people are interested in measuring alpha at the given scale also, but measuring this running, probing the running is very interesting. And now LHC data is probing this running at this TV energy scale really for the first time, this data points here. This one's here, right? Yeah, the other thing that you see is that, so for instance, tau decays are interesting because you measure the coupling at a really low scale, huh? and you see that they have, a, this has a relatively large error. Huh? You are almost close to the non perturbative regime. The tau, the tau mass is 1.2 GB, so it's really low energy. However, even if you measure this with a relatively large error, the renormalization group running is such that when you put the alpha measured at this scale, at this F mass, the error really shrinks. And this is why these determinations at low energy, if they can be done relatively precise, they are still very useful. No? Okay. And uh, yeah, so most of these lectures, however, are really about this high energy region where we know perturbation theory, where we can apply alpha is small and so on. About this low energy regime, uh, this is where confinement is here. And here we know really much, much less. This is somewhere where it's hard to, yeah. Here, this is where somehow confinement uh, kicks in and so where we cannot describe things accurately to where somehow things are strongly coupled a little bit. And um, yeah, so I don't know, uh, maybe, I'll have another little break here if somebody has questions about this part. Otherwise, I would move on to the next topic that I would like to cover. There are no questions, okay. Yeah, there is one. There is one. Okay. Now. Please, no. Hi. Um, maybe a silly question, but uh, when you compare the diagrams with the let's say some boson in the final state as well as the vertex correction, shouldn't there also have been uh, IR divergences from soft and collinear, uh, let's say gluons or whatever it was? Okay, so this is exactly the topic that I want to cover now. So, I, exactly, let me- good let me question. Continue. What? <laughs> so it was a good question. Yes, it was a good question, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So in fact, uh, I wanted to now tell you, let's go back again to this quantity and be a little bit more precise, maybe also writing down and working out what happens in this soft linear center. So again, we, we can take this amplitude, now writing it a bit more explicitly. So again, we, we are looking essentially at this amplitude here. So this is, uh, let's say, a photon, so this is, uh, so this, we can write a lower scale down to this for this, uh, really explicitly using Simon root. so you have a spin on U bar of P1, P1, and this is P1, P2, here I have my, that's the magnetic vertex minus E, E gamma nu, and I have a this our spin of this. And now I told you, yeah, when you emit the gluon, <coughs> You have uh, these two contributions where you essentially draw a gluon either from this line here or you can emit the gluon from that line here. Now, if you write down these amplitudes now, and then let me keep uh, sorry, write it in this. 
So when you write this amplitude, what happens? Let, let, let's write it down explicitly. When you have a Q Q bar and Q one, you have two contributions. So U Q one. So let's take first the one and the from Q one, and then you have minus I G S at the column matrix A, and then you have the polarization vector from that. Okay? Then you have here a propagator, which here then if this is K. This will involve only to P1 plus K. So the propagator will be I P1 plus K slash over P1 plus K squared. And then I have the electromagnetic vertex. And then I have another contribution where the gluon is emitted on the other side. So I start with the electromagnetic vertex. Then I have my propagator, which now involves a minus sign because uh, this is a sphere uh, and sphere. So this is P2 minus K squared. And then I will get the QCD vertex, PA polarization vector, the blue one. Okay. Now, the soft approximation allows you to compute this in a simplified way. So if we take the soft approximation means taking K much smaller than P1, P2, in the sense that the energy, so the energy and all the environments are much smaller. So what happens? In the soft approximation, we can essentially replace this. This would involve P2 squared in GCO function. Then it has minus two P2 K. And then there is a term that is k square, but we drop this k square here. Also, we can drop this bit here because we are smaller. And you can apply the Dirac equation here. So this is an epsilon. So this has a gamma mu and then is p1. You know that when you, you can flip this, so this becomes a u bar of p1. So you have essentially, so you have u bar of p1, you have epsilon slash p1 slash. You can anti commute this, but then you use the Dirac equation, this is zero. And then all the left, this is with uh, two times this g mu, two times epsilon p1, which is p1. So when you use your soft approximation, the amplitude takes the form. U bar of P1, then you get this uh, minus U e gamma mu, the TCD vertex, the other spinner, and then you get the uh, term that has P1 epsilon that comes from here, this one uh, here. The two, you see the two cancels, and then below we have here P1 K, and then you get P2 epsilon over P2 K. So you already see this. When you take a soft limit, you get this property of factorization. So the soft part comes. So the black here is what you had at lowest order, apart from the score on the When you square it here, you get the CFT, you know? But the rest really factorizes nicely. Out. And so in fact, if you square the amplitude, if you compute the amplitude squared, so this, M Q Q bar Q one squared. I don't know why this is not like this. Huh? So you get so the square of all these black, which I don't need to work out. I will simply call it. Okay, I don't need M Q Q bar squared. The P A squared will be a C F. And then I have the coupling square. Okay? And what happens to the red part? Well, when you sum over polarizations, uh, epsilon times epsilon will give you GMU. So, in essence, uh, let me, I have, sorry, I have problems with this. So, in essence, uh, what you get uh, is the lowest order amplitude uh, as you had before squared. You get the factor CF that comes from this DAPA, the coupling squared. And when you square the soft part and uh, take into account that epsilon times epsilon is a GMU, you simply get 
twice P1, P2 over P1, K, P, P2, right? And this is what, uh, this is a soft, I, what we call iconography. Right. Now this is right in terms of Lorentz invariance. Huh? One could also think of going in the, in the center of mass frame of the collision to somehow write the, in the center of mass frame, huh? you would have, uh, say an electron coming in like this, so here's the collision point. Then you have a quark going out, and quark going out. And you have this extra gluon here. Say so that you write it like this. So for instance, we can introduce this angle theta, it is the angle between uh, um, the gluon and uh, one of the two, say the quark. Okay. Then we can write this in terms of uh, energies and angles. Okay. And so, in the center of mass frame, the two P1 P2 have the same energy, let's call it E. So, these terms, uh, P1K, will be simply equal to the energy of uh, P1. We call it E1 times EK, one minus cos theta. And in the, now we consider the limit where the gluon is both soft and the collinear to say the quark. In that limit, the Q to bar will be essentially back to back. So P2K will be the energy of P2, EK, one plus cos theta. Okay. So that when you put it in here, you will get the factor one minus cos theta squared. Now, when you take this, so essentially this expression, what happens to that? You see that the factors of E cancel out, E1, E2 cancel out from the denominator and denominator. This will be proportional. If you think, look at, focus on the variables that have to do with the photon, with the, sorry, to do one. The proportion of the energy EK squared one minus cos squared of theta. Okay. And now what you have to do is you have to take this uh, and also integrate it over the phase space. Uh. So what, what you're really interested in if you want to compute the cross section is the integral where we say Q, Q to bar D1 of this full matrix element here. This is what you really need. Uh. And this again, one can write it. Let's let me let's keep it like this. One can write it as the d phi q to bar, and then so this amplitude m q to bar. This is the hard part we're not really interested in, and then the soft part takes its form. So this is this d three k the Lorentz Lorentz invariant phase space for the gluon. This is a here. So it will be familiar with this. And then you have this uh, CFGS squared. Then you get factor of one and one to n with the K squared, one minus cos squared of theta. Okay. And now what one can do is one can sort of write this in terms of uh, energies. And you see somehow, you see how this scales. So, so this scales. Uh, uh, Right, okay. so this would be ek squared d ek, but there is an ek here, right from here. And then we see that there is a one over ek squared from here. Okay. So, and the angular part, this is a the omega, the omega can be written as e cos theta to phi. Okay. So if you Put all these bits together, you somehow see that, and uh, maybe, maybe some problem to see it, uh, that you will have uh, d cos theta over one minus cos theta squared, uh, and uh, with d e over e, because this e k squared cancels out. Uh, so in essence, when you do this calculation, you take a soft limit, huh? you see that your cross section is somehow not only ultraviolet divergent as we saw before, 
but it's also iterated region. Okay? So in essence, one can when you one can then write it in this form. So the cross section that involves explicitly a quark and anti quark in this gluon is equivalent to the one without. And in the soft limit, then there is this additional factor that now including these factors of two and now including the factors of pi uh, and uh, using that alpha is g squared over pi. You can write it in this form energy over energy. Uh, the theta. You can write it as the theta over sine theta, or, uh, and then there is a divider. The important point is that when the energy goes to zero, we have a divergence, what we call a soft divergence. And when theta goes to zero, there is a collinear divergence. Okay. So this cross section is essentially simply not finite. If you ask for a quark and the quark in the view on the cross section, it's not finite. Now we know we have already seen it. What you have to do in TCD is you always have to do calculations at fixed order and the coupling constant. So if you include to that, to do a full calculation at order alpha, you have to include the, the virtual correction that does not involve the blue one. This bit here. If you compute this cross section, Q Q bar, the virtual correction in the soft limit, you will get essentially the same as what I wrote here. So let me not write it again. So let's see if I can not go. Let me see if it like this. So this bit here essentially multiplies this. But you have a minus sign here. So this incorrect idea is exactly the idea. The idea both in the real and the virtual, and when you combine everything together, things cancel. And this will keep exactly the finite terms, so you're not incorrect idea to get exactly this alpha over pi that you mentioned before. But in this calculation, this incorrect idea is a present. Now, this divergence, the soft divergence, is present when in the H fields in general, whenever, even if the particle that emits has a mass. So, for instance, a top that emits a soft one, there will be a soft divergence. But collinear divergences are there only if uh, the emitter is also is massless. And in essence, you see it from, uh, you see that somehow. This one minus cos theta, this structure here is like that if uh, the quark is, is massless. Otherwise, uh, you would have to assume you would have a mass that regulates its form. So, collinear divergences are there only when the particle that emits is massless, while the soft are there also in other cases. Um, and uh, yeah, this, uh, I mean, uh, I discuss this now in this uh, specific example, but these are really very. Typical properties to see the presence of incorrect divergences. Um, and uh, now, the fact that this divergence is cancelled, as I wrote down here, I told you, well, if you do this, if you compute the virtual and do the calculation, take the soft limit, you will see that they cancel out. Now, this is, a, I mean, it's not really a miracle. This is a day comes from the fact that when you do a real integration, Essentially, this is what you're doing. So, so if you do real integration, so you need the gluon from here. When you square an amplitude, this is essentially what you're doing. You have something like this. Okay? When you square an amplitude, this is equivalent to taking something like this, exchange, where this pattern, this is the phase space integration. Now, when you compute the virtual amplitude, 
Is it actually going to you have to interfere with this before? I mean. Okay, so this. Huh? Is equivalent to that. So here you have a three space integration here. And here it says this is a loop integral here, and the path is different. But you see that in terms of Feynman integral, Feynman, uh, Feynman rules, if you want, what you're writing is exactly the same things. And there is a minus, I mean, this, uh, this has a minus sign uh, that uh, you can see comes from unitarity, or you see explicitly comes from the fact that you have a trace of this uh, here. So this uh, cancellation of interact divergences is a generic property, but it's a generic property. You see, it's uh, really strictly related to performing this phase space integral here. Right. So the fact that here you're integrating and you are sufficiently inclusive on this integration so that this cancellation is not ruined. The cancellation between real and integration is not ruined. And there is a theorem here that is called uh, the Kinoshita It's called the Kinoshita theorem. And so what this theorem says is that interact singularities in a massless theory cancel out if you sum over degenerate states, initial time states. And what this means is that, for instance, if you have a hard particle, some hard quark that is propagating, and this hard quark emits a collinear gluon, in the limit where the gluon is some of the angle that goes to zero, you cannot resolve them. And so the two states are degenerate. And this is some of these degenerate states, the singularities will cancel. The same is true for a very soft photon. In the limit where the soft photon, even if it is at large angle, but in the limit where this is really very soft, and you cannot see it. And so these two states are degenerate. So physically, it means that you cannot distinguish a hard pattern from a pattern that comes together with its collinear or very soft radiation. And so, from this point of view, of course, the R ratio is something that is completely inclusive. You integrate over everything in the final state. And so, of course, you will uh, respect the skinship of in our right here, because you are not restricting the real radiation at all. No? And so, mm, so the question is a little bit, uh, uh, Okay, what is really the property of Arbitra and thesis? But also, can one think of different observables that uh, have this property of uh, being finite? And historically, the first maybe observables that were defined uh, that uh, are infrared safe, but also say something more about the final state, the deeper characterization of the final state, uh, are the so called uh, Sterman Wild objects. Uh, so, yeah, proposed by Sloan, Wilder, Green, and in the same So, what are the these German Wilder objects? Well, they introduce two parameters huh? epsilon and delta. And they essentially say, well, if you have, like, you think about having a Essentially, in plus and minus position, you have the quarks coming out, and these quarks radiate. And so here there is radiation, here there is radiation, then there is something to be of that chain. And so, on. so two sterile wind objects uh, are essentially two cones. Uh, of opening angle delta that contain uh, all uh, the energy of the event 
but for a small fraction epsilon. So you allow outside the jets to have a little bit of energy here to account for the soft radiation, but inside the jets you should have all the energy here, but for a little bit. So why is this fine? Like, well, why is this incorrect? It's incorrect because the, if you have a radiation that is inside the jets, Or somehow, if you have a pattern that is originally inside the jet and it emits something collinear, then in the limit of collinear radiation, everything will remain in the jet. If you have soft radiation, but in the limit where this radiation is really very soft, it will be below this epsilon. And so, um, and so nothing. So, soft radiation or collinear emission cannot change the structure of this jet. Is this concept clear of how this is defined and how what this really means? I hope so. So one can then do in this case, one can do a calculation of the first order of this uh, cross section. And okay, I don't know whether I should do it explicitly or not. Maybe I should simply say so. If you, what happens at lowest order? Well, at lowest order, there is nothing. You have only two to bar, there is no radiation. So uh, the volume term is uh, completely included in this thermal wide object. So the lowest order, you have the sigma volume. That's it. So first you have sigma volume, this all contributes. Then you have a virtual correction. So have a virtual, well, what happens in this picture? You have one virtual gluon. You can have something like this. You will see that the virtual gluon cannot affect the virtual is always integrated. So you will have integrals over this the energy by energy, the angle by angle. So the virtual term will have this negative sign that we said will be proportional to the coupling square to some factors, so proportional to the Born perception. And then we have this uh, integral between zero and some hard scale, let's call it e, or uh, the infinity. The energy over energy, so this is a okay. k. And then you have this d cos theta over one minus cos square theta, where you integrate here everywhere, between zero and five, everywhere. Then you have a real radiation. And now a real radiation is what becomes more thick. If you have real radiation, what happens? That something can contribute if it's outside, only if the energy is below epsilon e. So you will have a term, for instance, it has this form CF, G, sorry, G squared over pi squared sigma born. Then you have to integral over the energy. And now, if the energy is below this epsilon E, then this guy can be emitted everywhere. Sorry, cos squared theta between zero and pi. This can be anywhere if the energy is sufficiently small. Or you can say, well, the energy is now large, so I can have a term where the energy is large. So I exceed this epsilon e up to the center of mass energy, let's say. But then the angular integral responds. And so I get the term where the energy is between, the angle is between zero and delta. And then I get the collinear to the other side, so pi minus delta to pi, because theta over one minus cos squared theta. Now, when you combine all these bits together, you see that whenever you have a singularity, so you see this D over E here is divergent with the negative sign, but this will cancel with the sorry, um, which is bound here. And the, also the angular integrals will cancel. However, when you combine bits, 
what happens is that your cross section, the first order in the coupling constant, becomes uh, takes its form. So the cross section to first order in alpha is equal to the bone cross section, sigma zero. One plus, uh, if you combine uh, the overall factors, uh, it's a usual alpha over four pi with the color factor. And then you get the log of epsilon, log of delta. So what, does, what do we see from here? First, we see that when you do this calculation, as I told you, the effective parameter is never really alpha, it's alpha times color factor over pi. This is um, but then we also see that the, when you have something less inclusive, but uh, when you start limiting the phase space for real radiation, as you do in the thermal wide objects, uh, you can have, uh, uh, in fact, I read this cancer, but you have lo logarithmic leftovers from this cancellation related to the fact that this integral, uh, what uh, contributes to the cross section has a bound that is epsilon times e and the upper bound is e. And when you integrate uh, the energy by energy, you get the log of the ratio of these two scales, which is exactly this epsilon. And the same for the end of this solution. So what you also see, by the way, here explicitly, is that when epsilon becomes very, very small, or delta becomes very small, huh? so, when you are really trying to constrain a lot the phase space for real radiation, your performance measurement that is becoming more and more exclusive. This uh, expansion uh, might fail. It might fail because alpha is smaller, but log epsilon or log delta uh, can become very large. So when this uh, alpha is 0.1, but if log epsilon or log delta become 10, the expansion you see that uh, will not work out anymore. And uh, so in that case, uh, um, what you have to do is you have to do a calculation that resumes the square of order orders in the coupling constant. That's something that maybe I will also say something a little bit more about this. Uh, other questions so far? I think I have another five minutes. So if there are questions, I will stop here. Otherwise, I will be a little bit here. Yes, there is a question. Please, Daniele. Thank you. I have a question about something we said before, just I missed it and I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, about the renormalization group equation, um, I, I just didn't get how we use it, really. Uh, I mean, we say we, we, when we wrote it for uh, this amplitude, we say that uh, this should be independent of, on the scale mu. And, but then how we use this uh, renormalization group equation that we get. So this equation fails, you so let me see if I can make this sense. Yeah. So the, the, this is a zero because this A shouldn't uh, uh, be dependent over mu square, isn't it? Exactly. So okay. this is zero. Because mu is a scale that you introduced, it's your normalization scale. Yeah? Okay. So by the way, when, when you write zero again, uh, what this really means is always zero at the order at which you calculate it. Yeah? Uh, okay, okay. So, okay, because uh, what I was in, in generally um, thinking is that since this should be independent over mu, if I change mu, this shouldn't change and stop. So I, I get the result and then nothing should change. Why this is wrong? No. No, no, no. So your result will change if you change mu. This is something we will see. Hopefully, if I manage, I always will be here. But uh, we can also see some of here in alpha when, when I wrote alpha, no? Well, here, let's look in R explicitly, right? So if you look at this expression for R2, so what does this mean that this is independent of the scale? It's not true. There is new area. But the explicit log mu that you have in the alpha square theorem, this cancels the mu dependence of this now for mu. So up to the alpha square, this is mu independent. So, um, okay. Okay, but when you, so let me use again this kind of, so this mu here cancels the mu dependence here. This cancels up to alpha squared. 
This new dependence here will affect the alpha t theorem. So this result is new dependent at order alpha cube. And in fact, we will see this later. This dependence is what we often use to estimate the uncertainty on higher order terms. So you change mu. You know that this will change uh, to terms beyond the order the pure certification. And so it can somehow roughly throw over the terms that you have neglected. Okay, okay. And again, as before, if we could uh, calculate this at all order, we would eliminate this uh, uh, scale dependence, but we cannot. And so, okay, okay. And then from the renormalization group equation, we can uh, somehow resum this dependence. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question, uh, Federica, please. Hi, yeah, I have a question. I don't know if uh, I missed it or not, but um, I was wondering, when we talked about the cancellation of infrared divergences, um, I was wondering, is this cancellation exact? Because what, what I have in mind is when you have initial state QCD radiation, then the collinear divergence is not really does not really cancel, so you have to uh, renormalize the PDFs. So I'm just uh, this is the topic of the next lecture. Next lecture, I really want to cover what changes in structure when you include initial state QCD radiation. But let me anticipate uh, what happens. To some extent, uh, the picture is the same. You have this collinear. So what does not cancel? They are the collinear. Um, emissions from the initial state. And they simply, they don't cancel out because the hard collision happens at different energies. So if you have a hard collinear radiation, the hard spectrum data happens at the reduced, reduced center of mass energy. And so this will uh, ruin the cancellation that we have with theatrical corrections, where there the hard spectrum is always at the, uh, not, nobody takes away radiation. Right, but the problem is that you have these emissions before they have spectrum. So what you do is you absorb uh, these collinear emissions into a redistribution of the pattern distribution functions. So, and so in the same way as here, we have a coupling that depends on the scale, you have PDFs uh, that depend on uh, the scale there. Because they have absorbed uh, the collinear radiation. Uh, and okay. they are, uh, the way of uh, absorbing this divergence is this, uh, to one skill dependent, exactly the same way as for the couple of forms and so on. Okay, so basically uh, in the in the final state, the cancellation is exact because um, yeah. the energy is fixed, right? So yeah. in the final state, they really cancel, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Because the structure is really the same. So this uh, little picture that I drew, um, what did I do? Yeah. This is really somehow that uh, what you're competing is really the same. But you see some, okay, we'll see it more in the next lecture. But when you take away a uh, collinear initial state radiation takes away stuff before this hard vertex here, before the hard vertex. So here, this and this don't happen at the same energies anymore. And this ruins uh, the calculation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question in the in the chat. I see. Can you see it? I So this is a question from Hector, eh? Yes. Well, I have to say that I don't know what this is. Uh, for the, the, the answer is no, it doesn't. Ah, okay. <laughs> so what is this? But, uh, it's an, uh, what is this, a naive exponentiation of the... I mean, is the improvement of block agnostic is the first general result of exponentiation in QED is from the 60s, 70s. Okay. And it's based uh, on what identities in QED. The structure of QCD is very different, and, uh, yes. and this, that doesn't work in the same way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we'll not say too much about this exponentiation to all orders. Uh, but okay, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe I stop here. Um, so, okay, exponentiation in QCD is still based on, on the idea of taking this soft approximation. Uh, and then, uh, so what we call leading logarithmic result in QCD is still obeys. Uh, to some extent, it's still similar to what can be done in QD. You, you do the things like this where you assume a very strong order in between the missions. Uh, so they don't talk to each other, and to some extent, the leading logarithmic, uh, where you're uh, for one power of alpha, you have two logs, uh, one collinear and one soft. Uh, it still amounts to exponentiating the one gluon result at the very end. Uh, that is still true. But uh, once you want to go beyond that, then things become much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I don't know, I'm really out of time or I have another few minutes? Well, uh, it would be better to stop because in uh, less than 30 yeah, minutes- to show some plots and stuff, uh, but okay, maybe I'll stop and just start tomorrow. No more questions then? I don't see any.